Neanderthals, the indigenous people of Western Eurasia, interbred with modern humans, but they were not a homogenous population. In the Near East, they introgressed their genes over a very long period of time, resulting in a high penetration of their genes into modern humans, and vice versa. However, rather than a short period of mixing, these groups lived together for over 200,000 years, which is a revolution in our understanding of human evolution, according to a new paper. In fact, it is a paradigm shift in our understanding of Neanderthal-Homo sapiens interactions, suggesting a hybrid population rather than two separate species. In the rolling limestone hills and shadowed caves of the Levantine region of the eastern Mediterranean, a drama unfolded over hundreds of thousands of years that would shape the very essence of humanity. This region, lying at the narrow bridge between Africa and Eurasia, was more than a landscape. It was a meeting ground. Rivers cut through fertile valleys where gazelle herds gathered, oak and pistachio forests shaded the streams, and caves opened in the cliffs above. Here, different kinds of humans met, mingled, and sometimes merged. Their fossils, preserved in the caves of Zutier, Tabun, Skul, Kafzer, Mislia, and Nesha Ramla, preserve not only their bones, but echoes of their friendly encounters, revealing a story that is at once scientific and deeply human. It is not too much to call the Levant a Neanderthal melting pot. The hominins who lived here were neither wholly Neanderthal nor wholly Homo sapiens, but something in between, a population blending traits, cultures, and eventually genes. They cooked, hunted, and loved together, and in their unions lay the genetic exchanges that still live on in us today. In 1925, French and British-led archaeologists climbed into the cave of Mugharet el Zutia, the cave of the robbers, high above the dry lowlands. There he found a fragmentary but powerful witness to the region's deep past, the Galilee skull. It was not a full cranium, but a frontal bone and zygomatic, enough to suggest a face that would have been broad, with a prominent brow but not the exaggerated jutting mid-face of classic Neanderthals. Scholars including American anthropologists Theodore McCown, British archaeologist Dorothy Garrod, and British anatomist Sir Arthur Keith puzzled over it. Was Zutia an early Neanderthal, a late Homo erectus like Asian P. King Man, or something more transitional? Decades later, researchers would conclude that Zutia exhibits a generalized frontal and zygomatic morphology, possibly indicative of the population that gave rise to modern humans and Neanderthals. In other words, Zutia did not fit neatly into categories. It was a fossil of a people who had not yet split fully into separate species, or perhaps of a people who defied such divisions altogether. It was a face at the crossroad of humanity. When Zutia Man lived, perhaps 350,000 years ago, the valleys below were cool and fertile. Herds of aurochs thundered across the plains, and ostriches laid their heavy eggs in shallow nests. The inhabitants of Zutiaman's world cracked those eggs, roasted them in fires, and slurped down the yolks, much as later excavators at Mislia Cave would discover had been done there almost 200,000 years ago. It is easy to imagine a family huddled around a small fire, the yellow yolk running down their chins, their laughter echoing in the cave. Their faces may have looked different from ours, heavier brows, perhaps broader noses, but their gestures of sharing food, of warmth in the night, are profoundly familiar. Nearly a century after this dig, excavators at Nesha Ramla uncovered bones of another enigmatic hominin. The remains, dating between 140,000 and 120,000 years ago, belong to individuals who combined traits of Neanderthals with older populations. The leader of the excavation, Professor Hershkovitz, explained, the discovery of a new type of hominin is of great scientific importance. It enables us to make new sense of previously found human fossils, add another piece to the puzzle of human evolution, and understand the migrations of humans in the old world. These were not Neanderthals, nor were they Homo sapiens, yet they were close to both. They lived alongside Homo sapiens in the Levant, sharing the same lands, the same hunting grounds, and perhaps the same hearths. Scientists had never imagined that alongside Homo sapiens, archaic hominins roamed the area so late in human history. The Nesha Ramla people made Levalois stone tools, 
carefully shaped flakes that required abstract planning and skilled hands. The very same technology was used by Homo sapiens in the region, making it impossible to distinguish who had crafted a tool simply by its form. This technological overlap suggests interaction, imitation, and perhaps teaching between groups. The tools tell us that Nesha Ramla was no primitive holdover. They were innovators, and their presence challenges the notion that Neanderthals were born in Europe. They were not Neanderthals or Homo sapiens, but a different kind of human. Hershkovitz argued, our findings imply that the famous Neanderthals of Western Europe are only the remnants of a much larger population that lived here in the Levant, and not the other way around. What's more, the Levantine Neanderthals and the Western European Neanderthals are not a single group. Imagine the scene 150,000 years ago. Along the oak and pistachio groves, near what is now Mount Carmel, smoke rises from fires in two caves, perhaps only a few valleys apart. In one cave, a group of Homo sapiens roast hare and turtle, cracks ostrich eggs and chips flint into long, sharp blades. In the other, the Nesha Ramla people do the same. Their voices carry across the valley, their children play by the streams, their hunters stalk gazelle along the same ridges. When they encountered each other, whether with caution, curiosity or conflict, we cannot know. But the genetics tell us that they did more than meet. They mingled. As one account puts it, while out foraging, Homo sapiens may have mated with these Neanderthal-like inhabitants. In this land that later birthed the Bible, they likely knew each other in the biblical sense. The phrase captures the intimacy of these meetings. The caves bear witness not only to tool traditions and animal bones, but to the shared humanity of touch, love, and kinship. Children would have been born of these unions, carrying genes from both lineages. And because this happened over thousands of years, the Levant became a true melting pot. The fossils and the genetics converge on one idea. This region blurred the lines between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. It was not a place where one species replaced another, but a place where boundaries dissolved. The Zutia fossil, too early to be a Neanderthal but too derived to be Homo erectus, already foreshadows this blending. Nesho Ramla makes it explicit, showing a population that both contributed to Neanderthals and interacted with Homo sapiens. As the morphometric analysis of Zutia concluded, Zutia exhibits a generalized frontal and zygomatic morphology, possibly indicative of the population that gave rise to modern humans and Neanderthals. And the Nesha Ramla team emphasized that their fossils make us question the theory that Neanderthals originated in Europe. Instead, the Levant was the crucible, where lineages mixed, mingled, and spread outward. The melting pot metaphor is not only scientific but visceral. Here, by the campfires, shells were strung into ornaments, aurochs bones split for marrow, and ostrich eggs boiled in clay pits. The people laughed, quarrelled, and reached across the boundaries of kind to share their lives. Over time, those lives braided together into lineages that would travel into Europe and Asia, carrying Levantine genes far from their homeland. The sequence of fossils from the Levant reads like a layered record of meetings. After Zutia came Tabun, with its Neanderthal remains dated to around 120,000 years ago. School and Kafse revealed burials of early Homo sapiens from between 120,000 and 90,000 years ago. At Manot Cave, a 55,000-year-old modern human skullcap proved that Homo sapiens were present just as Neanderthals still thrived at Amud and Kibara. The Mislia jaw, at 177,000 to 194,000 years old, showed that Homo sapiens had been here even earlier than imagined. Each of these discoveries fits into the picture of a land where waves of populations met and merged. The Manot Cave researchers remarked, it has been suspected that modern man and Neanderthals were in the same place at the same time, but we didn't have the physical evidence. Now we do. That evidence shows not a brief overlap, but a long continuum of coexistence. The scientific understanding of this melting pot grew hand in hand with excavation history. British archaeologist Dorothy Garrod's work at Mount Carmel was foundational, 
uncovering school and tub and fossils that immediately entered debates about Neanderthals and modern humans. Theodore McCown described the school skeletons, including School 5, who they called Mount Carmel Man, found with a wild boar mandible across its chest, one of the earliest signs of ritual burial ever found. Later excavations expanded the record. At Kafsa, beautifully preserved Homo sapiens skeletons were discovered, some buried with ochre and antler horns. At Amud Cave, a towering Neanderthal male was found with a massive brain case. At Kabara Cave, a Neanderthal hyoid bone was preserved, proving that these people had the anatomical capacity for speech. And in more recently, Nesha Ramla and Mislia added still deeper layers of context. Each generation of excavators brought new methods, from stratigraphy to radiometric dating to DNA sequencing. What they uncovered, however, always pointed back to the same truth. This region was not a periphery, but a center, not a backwater, but a fountainhead of human evolution. Modern DNA studies confirmed what the fossils suggested. This interbreeding almost certainly occurred in the Levant, when early Homo sapiens leaving Africa first encountered the resident archaic populations. In every cell of modern Eurasians lies the echo of those encounters in the Levant. As a Journal of Human Evolution study explained, the sequencing of the complete Neanderthal genome revealed that people in Eurasia are partially descended from Neanderthals. These studies conclude that interbreeding between archaic and modern humans most likely occurred in the Near East. But did it occur recently, or over a long period of time, is the question still being debated. What was it like to live in this melting pot? The archaeological record provides glimpses. In Mislia Cave, excavators found evidence of fires used to roast hare, turtle and ostrich eggs, as well as acorns and saltbush leaves. The bones of aurochs and deer were split open for marrow, and flint tools were scattered across the cave floors. The people were skilled hunters, adaptable foragers, and capable toolmakers. At school and Kafse, the burials show symbolic thought. Ochre-stained bones suggest ritual, and antler horns placed with the dead indicate belief in something beyond death. At Tabun and Amud, Neanderthals lived with equal sophistication, crafting Musterian tools, caring for their sick, and burying their dead. When Homo sapiens and Nesha Ramla people met, they were not strangers in every sense. They recognized each other as beings who cooked, crafted, hunted, and mourned. The differences between them, though real, were not enough to prevent interbreeding, not enough to prevent their children from thriving. One can imagine a shared campfire between groups, a young woman from one lineage and a man from another. Their language is different, but their gestures universal. They share roasted meat and warm themselves in the glow. The next morning, the children run together, their footprints mingling in the dust. Those footprints may be lost, but the DNA remains, written in the blood of their descendants. The Levant was not simply a passageway between continents, it was a crucible, where human forms melted into one another, where Neanderthals and Homo sapiens ceased to be separate species in any absolute sense. The Zutia skull, the Nesha Ramla fossils, the skull and Kafse burials, the Manot skull cap and the Mislia jaw are not isolated finds but chapters of a single story. Together they tell us that the boundaries between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens were porous, that their lives overlapped for tens of thousands of years, and that in their unions a new humanity was forged. As Hershkovitz put it, the Nesha Ramla fossils make us question the theory that Neanderthals originated in Europe, suggesting that the ancestors of European Neanderthals lived in the Levant as early as 400,000 years ago, repeatedly migrating westward to Europe and eastward to Asia. The Levant was thus not the edge of the story, but its heart. In the end, this land was a melting pot in the truest sense, a place where genes, tools and cultures mixed where fires burned in caves above the valleys, and where people slurped egg yolks from ostrich shells, unaware that their lives together would shape the destiny of humankind. Thank you for watching.